It's early March in Kentucky. The days are getting longer, but the trees are still bare, and we can expect another month of nighttime frosts and occasional snow. By early April, we might be able to seed the first of our cool season greens outdoors. Spring is around the corner. For Paul Wiedeger, who farms near Bowling Green, Kentucky, it has been spring all winter. Paul and his wife Allison grow spring crops like lettuce, spinach, and kale in solar-heated hoop houses called high tunnels. Their five high tunnels support a diverse mix of direct seeded crops and transplants growing in rich organic soils. Year-round production gives the Wiedigers a steady source of income, and customers love getting fresh produce in the middle of winter. Paul and Allison have shared their system with other growers through regular presentations, workshops, and even a production guide called Walking to Spring. Other Kentucky producers are adopting similar systems based on double-layered high tunnels. Two layers of plastic separated by an air pocket maintained by a 60-watt blower fan help trap the daytime heat. All of the tunnel's warmth comes from the sun, so the temperature in the tunnel falls at night, but not as much as outside. On a typical winter day at the Wiedigers farm, the outdoor temperature stays below freezing between about midnight and 9.30 in the morning, and peaks in the low 40s around 3 in the afternoon, as shown by the blue line on this graph. The temperature inside the tunnels is shown by the yellow line. It usually stays above freezing through the night and peaks in the low 60s, warm enough for active growth of cool season crops. It could get much hotter inside on sunny winter days, but Paul and Allison usually open the windows for ventilation. The outdoor temperature has to fall below about 24 degrees Fahrenheit before it freezes in the tunnels. Sometimes that happens. On a chilly January night in 2000, the temperature at the Wiedigers farm fell to 14 degrees Fahrenheit outside and about 24 degrees inside the tunnels. The spring greens looked like they had been frost killed at sunrise, but perked up again by early afternoon, by which time it was 80 degrees inside the tunnels, still below 20 degrees outside. Using high tunnels for winter vegetable production has worked very well for the Wiedigers and the other Kentucky growers who have adopted similar systems, but they are increasingly encountering a disease problem. The fungus Sclerotinia sclerotiorum thrives under the cool, moist conditions typically found in high tunnels in winter and attacks many of the cool season crops growing in high tunnels. Young plants sprout and then die back, dissolving into a slimy mess. Older plants wilt when their roots are attacked. The fungus cannot grow under hot, dry conditions. It survives the summer by forming hard, heat-resistant bodies that look like small pieces of charcoal, called sclerotia. The sclerotia sprout small, pink, mushroom-like structures, called apothecia, under the cool, moist conditions that favor the fungus's growth. The apothecia spreads spores that infect the leaves and stems of susceptible plants. Fungal filaments also grow out of the sclerotia, through the soil, infecting nearby roots. The fungus grows on the roots, leaves, or stem, forming the characteristic white mold that gives the disease its name on lettuce. As the plant tissue dies, it becomes limp and slimy, and the fungus produces more sclerotia, which are deposited in the soil and on the soil surface. When conditions are favorable for the fungus, the new sclerotia sprout and the cycle begins again. Although the Wiedigers had wondered about the dead patches in their direct seeded beds for some time, they didn't realize the problem was caused by Sclerotinia sclerotiorum until University of Kentucky plant pathologist Paul Vincelli visited their farm and diagnosed the problem. Here Paul Vincelli and Paul Wiediger pick sclerotia out of an infected bed. Two tiny apothecia each smaller than a dime can be seen growing from the buried sclerotia next to the dying plants. In 2006, the USDA's Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program gave me and Paul Vincelli a grant to test ways of managing sclerotinia sclerotiorum in high tunnels that would be compatible with national organic program standards. That meant no synthetic fungicides, fumigants, or genetically modified organisms. We had two tactics in mind, both of which would target the sclerotia during the summertime when the fungus is not actively growing. We figured if we could destroy the sclerotia, we'd break the disease cycle. 
The first tactic we wanted to try was solarization, putting a layer of plastic over the soil surface at the height of summer to trap enough solar energy to kill the sclerotia with heat. The second was biofumigation, adding mustard greens to the soil. Members of the mustard family produce a group of chemicals called glucosinolates, thought to help prevent cancer in humans. When glucosinolates break down in the soil, they release gases that are toxic to some fungi. We wanted to see if we could use decomposing mustards to kill sclerotia. We conducted studies in the Weedigers High Tunnels in late July and August of 2006, 2007, and 2008. Between the time the Weedigers had removed their spring tomatoes and planted their fall crops. These video clips were taken by my research assistants, Brian Geyer and John Rogers, while they were setting up the study in 2008. They divided empty beds in the tunnels into 10-foot segments, which were randomly assigned to one of four treatments. Some were left untouched. Some were covered with plastic. Some had mustard greens incorporated into the soil. What we want to do with these mustards is chop them up and mash them up as much as possible to release all the glucosinolates out of them uh, so that they'll have a better chance at being potent against the uh, fungus okay. in the high tunnel. We're feeding these in here and I'm happy to say that it's working fairly well. I'll give you a look inside the bag here, what we're dealing with. This is the end product. We've got some stems in there, but you can see that most stuff is really broken up, and that's going to hopefully release all those glucosinolates into the soil. And some had both the mustard greens and the plastic. We thought that the plastic might help seal in the gases released by the mustards to make the biofumigation strategy more effective. Brian buried mesh bags of sclerotia in the middle and at the edge of each plot. He buried the bags in layers between the soil surface and six inches below Another the surface. Another five centimeters of soil. A bag was collected from each location after two days, two weeks, and a month. Three more bags. And bring in the rest to the soil surface. And putting three on top. We're going to do that in the middle and the edge of each one of these plots. We have right here, these are temperature taking probes. We're going to insert these at each soil level that we're burying these sclerotia bags. These are going to take temperature readings for us. We'll be able to monitor how hot and cold it gets in the middle of the day in each of these treatments underneath this plastic or in the controls or at nighttime. We'll be able to monitor it all. What I want to try to do, you can see these mustards in this plot. This is a biofumigation plot. With this water, we're trying to get a really good soak going on the surface, and you can kind of see it uh, getting really uh, moisture uh, ridden on the surface here. And what we want to do is create uh, a, a surface that's going to dry out and hold all those glucosinolates in. So those glucosinolates are releasing themselves into the soil air right now. We want to try to trap them in by creating this crust. It's about 11 o'clock here at the farm in the tunnel. It's probably somewhere between 100 and 105 degrees. and we got one more step to do, and we're just keeping cool. The final step was to put down the plastic for solarization. We used clear plastic, laid over top of the irrigation tape and held down by soil piled along the edges. The plots were irrigated regularly during the treatment period, to create hot, humid conditions under the plastic. Recall the daily air temperature fluctuations inside the Weedigers high tunnels in winter. Indoor temperature typically fell to the mid-30s around dawn and peaked in the mid-60s in early afternoon. The daily fluctuation was more pronounced inside than outside, but temperatures stayed warmer inside. The daily fluctuation in summer soil temperatures showed a very similar pattern. Without the extra sheet of plastic used for solarization, the soil surface inside the tunnel fell to about 80 degrees at dawn and warmed to about 110 degrees in early afternoon. Those temperatures are shown in blue. The temperature of solarized soil, shown in purple, fell to about 90 degrees at dawn and hit a daily peak around 130 degrees each afternoon. Temperatures were cooler in 2008 than 2007, 
but the difference between solarized and unsolarized soil was similar. At two inches below the soil surface, the daily peaks were a little lower and the daily lows were a little higher. The tendency toward moderation continued at four and six inches below the soil surface. And what effect did this have on the sclerotia? In 2007, about 60% of the sclerotia collected from the untreated soil surface after four weeks produced apothecia when they were subjected to six weeks of cool, moist conditions. That compared with about 40% of sclerotia in soils treated with mustard greens. Not significantly different. None of the sclerotia at the soil surface germinated after solarization, or the combination of solarization and biofumigation. The results were very similar in 2008. Sclerotia collected from two inches below the soil surface showed higher germination rates in the absence of solarization, but little or no germination after solarization. Solarization also killed sclerotia that were four inches below the soil surface in 2007, but not in 2008. About 20% of the sclerotia collected from four inches below the surface germinated in 2008. Most of the sclerotia collected from six inches below the surface germinated in 2008 with or without solarization. Even at this depth, solarization completely inhibited germination in 2007. These results suggest several conclusions. They show that four weeks of summer solarization in a high tunnel can kill most sclerotia. The results from 2008 suggest that the effectiveness of solarization decreases with depth and depends on the temperatures achieved. Our biofumigation treatment with one and a half pounds of Pacific Gold mustard greens incorporated per square yard of soil in late summer did not reduce sclerotial germination. There may be other ways of making biofumigation work for control of sclerotinia sclerotiorum, but the method we used was not effective. Paul and Allison Wiediger have started incorporating a summer solarization period into their crop rotations in high tunnels with a sclerotinia sclerotiorum problem. By using Kentucky's summer heat to their advantage, they're overcoming a disease in order to keep their customers supplied with greens in winter and tomatoes in early spring. It's one piece of a system that reduces the need to truck lettuce from California or burn fossil fuels to heat greenhouses. That's sustainable agriculture. From Kentucky State University, I'm Michael Bomford.